Tonight we'll conclude our brief series on St. John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul. That is, St. John's description of the means by which our soul becomes completely and totally united with God. Since this is the last time in the three talk series, I'll, by, by way of reminder, only cover the terms and concepts of the dark night very concisely. There are basically six terms to remind ourselves of. The dark night itself, active, passive, spirit, sense, and soul. The dark night is that process which all souls pass through on their way to union with God. And this either occurs in this life, in purgatory, or in both. The dark night gets its name not because we are necessarily going through difficulties or tragedies, but because, as St. John reminds us, everything that happens to us, whether good, bad, or indifferent, is used by God for our benefit, for our sanctification, and ultimately to make us holier, to make us saints. And we really don't know how sanctification works. That is, how it is our soul comes to share in the divinity that belongs to God alone through these good, bad, or indifferent experiences. For to be a saint, to be in complete union with God, means we share in the divinity of Christ in the same way he shares in our humanity. And since we don't know how it is that this miracle for that's what it is, works. We call it the dark night. So let's quickly and briefly remind ourselves of the major concepts in the dark night. Active means things we do deliberately, which move us toward that union, like the things we give up, say, for Lent. Passive means disposing ourselves to accept God's grace, but he is the one that acts. In the first instance, we take the initiative. In the second instance, the passive case, we wait on the Lord. We ready ourselves for when God decides to take the initiative to draw us closer to him. In this case, God takes the initiative to remove those things we're not even aware of that keep us from coming closer to him. Sense means the five senses and the material world. The spirit is our innermost self and unseen spiritual realities. And finally, the soul. If the spirit is the innermost part of our being, who we are, the soul is the innermost part of our spirit. It's where God himself abides in us. You've heard the expression, in my heart of hearts. The heart corresponds to the spirit, the heart of hearts to the soul. The dark night, then, can be thought of as God passing through our spirits into our very souls. In the two prior talks, we covered the active and passive night of sense, which, if summed up in a single word, would be purgation and detachment, respectively. The active night of the spirit, in a single word, would be contemplation. Tonight, we'll conclude with the passive night of spirit, which can be summarized as abandonment. Father Foley, a holy Carmelite priest and scholar who has devoted his life to the study of St. John of the Cross, describes the passive night of the Spirit in this way. Quote, In the passive night of the Spirit, the inflow of God intensifies. The guiding light of contemplation becomes a searing ray that assails the soul. The soul stands utterly exposed and is overwhelmed by what it sees. 
Stripped of all its rationalizations and defenses, the soul stands naked before its sinfulness and lack of integrity. In consequence, it feels utterly wretched and believes that God has abandoned it. However, in reality, God is more united to the soul than ever before. By continuing to love one's neighbor while it endures the experience of its poverty and the feeling that God is absent, the soul is transformed and united to God." Unquote. The critical thing to remember about the passive night of spirit is worth reiterating. The soul feels God is abandoning it, but is in fact more closely united than ever before. The soul feels God is abandoning it, but in fact God is closer to it than ever before. By way of illustration, let's consider a soul that for many, many years passed through this passive night of spirit. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Mother Teresa took her solemn vows as a nun in 1937 and began her missionary work with the poor in 1948. She, she spent a few months in Patna, India to receive basic medical training and then ventured out into the slums. Soon she was tending to the needs of the destitute and the starving. In the beginning of 1949, she was joined in her effort by a group of young women and laid the foundations of her new religious community, helping the poorest of the poor. This community would come to be known as the Missionaries of Charity. Though the Missionaries of Charity began in 1950 as a small congregation in Calcutta with 13 members, by 1997, it had grown to more than 4,000 sisters running orphanages, AIDS hospitals, and charity centers worldwide and caring for refugees, the blind, disabled, aged, alcoholics, and homeless, as well as victims of floods, epidemics, and famine. In 1997, the missionaries of charity were offer operating 517 missions in more than 100 countries. Mother Teresa died on September 5, 1997. Externally, anyone can readily see that Mother Teresa's life was one of heroic service to the poor, was one of holiness. Internally, during the last 50 years of her life, her spiritual life was one of extreme dryness. Think about that. For five decades, she did not feel God's presence as she once had. She once asked, quote, where is my faith? Even deep down, there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. When I try to raise my thoughts to heaven, there's such convic convicting emptiness that those very thoughts return like sharp knives to hurt my very soul." Unquote. Mother Teresa was in the midst of a 50-year journey through the passive night of spirit. But as she herself knew, but didn't feel, God was more united to her soul than ever before. And by heroically continuing to love her neighbor while she endured the experience of her soul's poverty before God and the feeling that he was absent, her soul was transformed and united to God himself. Mother Teresa's postulator, that is, the official responsible for gathering evidence for her canonization, said she may have experienced something similar to what Jesus Christ did when he was crucified and said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which translated means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thus, 
Even our Lord in his human nature, unstained by sin, experienced the passive night of spirit. As we mature spiritually, it becomes more and more necessary that we understand this dark night of the soul. Not understand as in we could pass a test, but rather understand what we are experiencing is in fact God working in us. The dark night is not some kind of checklist where we declare victory when we've completed all the steps. Rather, it's more like all four types of dark night happening in parallel at different rates, some more dominant at times, others less. As Americans, we love clarity and the ability to measure our progress towards a goal, but that removes any element of faith, any dependence on God's grace, which is completely antithetical and contrary to union with God. By grace we have been saved through faith. Nevertheless, that we don't know how the dark night works, why it works, and the fact that we're not in control is very disturbing for some. But think about this. If we did understand everything about how to achieve union with God, and we were in control of the process and could make progress by our own effort and strength, it wouldn't be the three persons of the most holy trinity we were uniting ourselves with. It would be a God of our own making. That is, it would be no God at all.